Welcome to the Knowledge Graph seminar. As you know, the focus for this week is on Knowledge Graph data models. Last week, I gave you an overview of uh, both Property Graph and RDF data models. Today, we are pleased to have two experts on each of those two topics. Uh, Dr. Petra Selmer, she works for Neo4j in the query language design work, design group, where she is involved in the development of CIFR, as well as uh, she is contributing to the international standardization efforts for graph query languages, as well as for graph query extensions to uh, SQL. Uh, Professor Ozu is a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science at University of Waterloo. Throughout his career, he has been working on uh, distributed database systems. He has written a textbook on the topic, as well as he is the uh, editor of the Encyclopedia on Database Systems. His contributions have been uh, recognized by multiple professional societies, including ACM and IEEE, as well as through uh, numerous awards, such as Lifetime Achievement Award and Test of Time Award. We are hoping that each of these speakers will give us um, about 30 minutes of technical overview, which will leave us about 20 minutes or so at the end uh, to ask them more in-depth questions. We are going to uh, begin with uh, Dr. Selmer. Petra, over to you. So just showing the screen. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes, you yeah. can. Okay. Right. Thanks very much, Vina, and um, I'm very, very pleased and happy to be here. So thank you for having me. So over onto the presentation. So uh, just generally a very quick outline of the talk. So what I'll be doing is giving a very quick recap of the property graph data model. So I know in a previous lecture, you guys will introduce the uh, model, but um, just in case you need a bit of reminding, I'll just whiz through that very, very quickly. Um, and then I'll actually go over onto the Cypher query language, and I'll be focusing in particular on the read-only portion of Cypher, and in particular also on the bits of the read-only portion of Cypher that really gives a lot of um, rocket boosting to actually uh, reading and um, accessing graph data. Um, I'll then actually mention a little bit about the Open Cypher project. So we've got sort of these terms, Open Cypher and Cypher. What do they actually mean? So Open Cypher is technically the project that actually fosters the... Um, open version of the language cipher and uh, more about that in a bit and then i'll actually be introducing a gql or graph query language and this is actually the um query language that we are going to be standardizing alongside a sql property graph query extensions in um under the auspices of iso I iec and um, to actually end off with i'll be walking through a few of the proposed extensions we'll be making it both into the next version of cipher and also into gql so just to start with the property graph data model, there are basically three constructs that uh, compose the property graph data model. The first one is a node, and that's actually a synonymous term with vertex. So if you come from a very mathematical background, you're probably more familiar with the latter term. And essentially, this represents some entity within your graph, within your domain. And uh, essentially, in the property graph data model, as it currently stands at the moment, you can actually have that a node can have zero or more labels. Also, a node can have zero or more properties, and these are essentially name, uh, name value pairs. And one thing that's actually worth bearing in mind is that two nodes that have exactly the same set of labels can actually have completely different properties. So that's actually something that uh, very much plays into the uh, heterogeneous nature of graph data. So now we've got nodes in our graphs. So to actually augment that and to really make it a graph, we actually have the second construct, which, which is a, a relationship which is uh, synonymous with edge. I tend to actually say edge more often than relationships and because it's a shorter word to say. But anyway, they're synonyms, interchangeable. And essentially, this is the construct that really makes your graph a graph. And it essentially adds structure to your graph. And very importantly, it provides semantic context for your nodes. So your nodes on their own are not very useful, but once you actually have edges between them, you actually start building up a picture of what it actually all means and how it all fits together. Um, Looking now at sort of the attributes of an edge, essentially what uh, an edge can have is it must have one and only one type. And you can think of this as being synony synonymous or analogous rather to labels for nodes. But unlike a, a node, an edge can only have one type. Um, also an edge has got to have a direction. So there's always a sort of an uh, outgoing node and an incoming node. 
uh, relative to the edge. And um, also just like nodes, we actually could have properties. And just very importantly to mention, both for nodes and for edges, uh, they can have zero or more properties. So you do actually sometimes get uh, circumstances where you don't want to have any properties or any data as such attached to your node or edge. And that's certainly something we've seen sometimes. And uh, just to kind of uh, lead home the fact as well that an edge absolutely has got to have a start and an end node. And of course, we do actually cater for self edges. So an edge can actually have the same node, both as its starting and as its ending node as well. And just to kind of uh, delve a bit more deeply into a property, essentially that's a name value pair or a map. They can actually go on nodes and edges. And uh, this is actually where all the data will be stored. So it essentially can be something like name, age, weight, et cetera. And uh, usually actually uh, the name of the um, property is a string. So it's actually like, it should be the string name or the string age, et cetera. And then um, the value can be any one of a certain number of types. It can be an integer, uh, sort of a decimal, a string, even a list, et cetera. Right, so that's actually the property graph data model. So hopefully that's actually kind of got everybody's feet a bit wet and actually that uh, leads us nicely into Cypher, the query language itself. So introducing Cypher, so this has actually been around for quite a long time now. It was actually developed by Neo4j way back in 2010. And um, what actually happened is that five years later in 2015, we actually opened it up to everybody. So, remarkable. so over the years, obviously lots of uh, different graph database vendors have come to the fore. We actually thought it's such a great language, let's actually spread it and actually allow any implementer, whether they be practitioners in industry, or whether they actually be researchers, of which we've seen quite a few, they can all actually uh, implement Cypher. And we certainly um, created this project in order to actually allow that, for that to actually happen. So as I said, more about that uh, later on in the presentation. So um, just to talk a bit about uh, Cypher's characteristics, I'll just focus for now on the bottom half of the screen. So very much in footsteps of SQL, and I should also mention Sparkle as well, uh, there are lots of syntax and capabilities that we've inherited from those languages. So for example, we've got DQL for reads, and just uh, again, I mentioned that that's the focus of this talk. We also have DML for updates and for inserts and deletions. We also have uh, the capability of actually um, defining and specifying and managing constraints and indexes. So you may be actually now wondering why Cypher? So essentially what uh, it grew out of was actually the notion of defining a declarative graph pattern match, uh, sorry, graph pattern matching language that actually is very intuitive for users to use and that actually adheres to a lot of modern paradigms. And in fact, um, I'll be talking about one of those in a while. But um, essentially, the unique selling points, if you like, of Cypher are the fact that graph patterns are very easily expressible. That's essentially the beating heart of Cypher. It's a first class citizen. It actually allows you to um, formulate very easily recursive queries, variable length relationship chains, and the ability to actually return paths. So if we actually take a step back as to why somebody would actually use a property graph data model instead of, say, a relational database, the sorts of use cases you'd be looking at using a property graph data model for would be when you actually want to, for example, understand relationships between entities, especially in cases where you've got lots of different kinds of entities and lots of different relationships between them. You also would be looking at using the property graph data model for when you have lots of self-referencing to the same kind of entity, or if you want to actually explore relationships of uh, varying un or unknown depth. And also when you actually want to discover different routes or paths through your data. And so because of these four sort of um, intrinsic, uh, intrinsic uh, motivations for using a property graph database, Cypher was created specifically to actually be very, very um, valuable to actually fulfill those needs. So that's actually where we are coming from. So um, to actually start off at the beginning, the absolutely basic um, inner core of Cypher is the notion of a pattern. And uh, essentially, as you can actually see on the slide, we actually have uh, the fact that um, this notion of ASCII art, so you can actually sort of, uh, if you squint a bit, you can sort of see that the circle that you've drawn on the uh, whiteboard or napkin or whatever it is that you've uh, drawn out your uh, domain on can actually be uh, represented by round parentheses, for example. That would actually represent your node. Your edges would be sort of these arrowed um, constructs. So it's very much um, uh, ASCII art first, and that's actually how the patterns were born out of that. And uh, just to actually reiterate how important the, this notion of patterns are, they're not only in the matching, i.e. in the reading portion of Cypher, and actually you've got a read clause down at the bottom uh, 
left of the screen, they're actually also used a lot in updates and also in all the DDL statements and definitions too. So it's pretty much everywhere. That's the DNA of Cypher. So let's maybe just delve a bit more deeply into actually how you would uh, use these patterns in a read-only context. So uh, central to this is the notion of a match clause. And essentially what we have here are two keywords, so match and then a pattern. And return is actually the projection clause. So what you actually have in the match pattern, sorry, in the um, portion of the query following the uh, match statement is a, a pattern. And that essentially is uh, composed of two nodes uh, uh, separated by an edge. And actually, I'll just work left to right and just describe what's actually going on there. So on the left-hand side, we actually have the fact that we are starting at a node, which has a person label on it. And uh, we're also expecting that uh, that person labeled node must have a name relationship. And furthermore, if it does have a name relationship, the value of that name relationship must be done. Then what we're doing is actually finding all nodes that uh, basically uh, correlates to that particular node pattern. I'm actually examining them. Do any of them have an outgoing loves relationship? Uh, is there any edge going out from that node that actually has a, has a loves edge type on that? If there is, then we actually examine the um, node on the other side. And essentially there, we don't actually have any predicates at all. All we have there is a uh, node variable, and that's actually the node uh, that we actually then return in the return statement. So essentially just delving a bit more deeply into what the, the various different uh, versions, if you like, of uh, node and relationship patterns that you actually have. You actually have on the uh, left-hand uh, side column all the various uh, flavors of uh, node patterns. So all of them have got to be surrounded by round parentheses. If you actually uh, use any identifier before a colon, that's always going to be your node variable, and you can actually use that as an alias uh, to refer to that particular node later on in the query, especially when you actually start building up your queries by using multiple parts. If you actually want to specify a label, you then actually have got to use a colon and then a label. And as I mentioned before, nodes in the property graph data model can actually have zero or more labels. So say, for example, you want to actually uh, find a node that has both the uh, label person and employee. What you'd actually specify is um, colon person, colon employee. And that actually says, find me all nodes that have both of those labels on. Um, and then actually you have the uh, fact that uh, nodes can have properties as well. And very, very synonymously, the same goes for our relationships on the right-hand side. And now, if you actually are reading, if you're using these patterns for reading, i.e. in the match clause, what those uh, property map literals will actually be, i.e. those are the curly braces prop dot uh, value, those will actually act as equality predicates. So in your read statement, by actually saying something like in label prop value, you're actually saying that uh, that particular node must have a property with that name and with that value. But you can also use it for um, updates, as I mentioned earlier. And in that case, what you actually are doing in that sense is that that property literal, uh, property map literal, sorry, will actually be um, inserted or updated into your node. So use exactly the same paradigm for uh, mutating your graph. So looking about more, a little bit more into a more sort of a complicated uh, read-only statement, what we actually have here is, this is actually uh, the, the, the way a query actually is uh, structured. So you actually begin, so this is unlike SQL, you actually begin with what you actually are trying to look for. So here you've got your match statement, and this is just a, a bog standard um, triple node edge node pattern. Then actually can uh, filter with predicates. So you can use other property map literal if you are uh, interested in any, a property quality predicate, or you can actually use um, a where clause like you do in SQL. And this actually is a bit more advanced because you can actually use inequality predicates and uh, you can actually start tying up property values from all the different nodes in your pattern in the match. So it's uh, a lot more powerful there. Um, so anyway, that's very, very uh, familiar to users of SQL. And then you actually end, well, you almost end off with a return statement and that essentially is your projection clause. So that is analogous to a select statement in SQL. And you've got um, to hand all the various uh, functions that you have available in a SQL, like upper end aggregations and all those sorts of things. Um, and then also um, inherited from SQL is the notion of um, ordering and slicing and things like that. So that's, um, that's uh, pretty much, if you like, the uh, most basic query that you can actually have. So one thing to actually uh, bear in mind is if you look at the, um, <clears throat> pardon me, the box in the uh, top right corner is what's actually very, very 
nice is you're actually able to delineate quite complex shapes, if you like, in your um, pattern. So um, just having a triple is not very interesting. So the me framed framed is not really um, not very really illuminating. If you actually look at the match example I've given in the gray box, you can actually start to transcribe much more complicated shapes. It's not just linear patterns, but actually you can start transcribing star shaped patterns or T shaped patterns like this one is. So you have a match ABC. So that's actually three nodes separated by edges about which we do not care about anything. So we just have it as a dash. We don't actually provide any more information. Comma, another pattern, B to F. And actually what will happen is that the two B nodes will match to the same uh, node in the graph. So essentially what you've transcribed is a T-shaped pattern. And you can actually uh, uh, continue adding more common separated patterns in this way. So this actually gives you a lot of um, expressivity and flexibility with respect to uh, transcribing uh, complex uh, patterns that directly match your um, shape of graph that you want to match. So I believe in a previous presentation, uh, Vina had actually introduced you to the basic pattern matching capabilities in Cypher. So what I actually want to do on this slide and the next few is actually focus on um, the more advanced uh, pattern matching uh, features. So this is actually where it uh, dif uh, differentiates quite a lot from SQL. So what we actually have starting up at the top is um, we start with a basic triple. I'll just call that sort of borrowing from Sparkle heavily here, node edge node. That's maybe not uh, not all that sort of a uh, novel. But where it starts to get really powerful is when you actually add something called transitive closure or variable length path ma uh, variable length path matching. So in the very first query up there, you'll sort of see um, match me friend star first. And what that actually will say is traverse one or more friend relationships. So you start at the node on the left hand side me, then actually you'll fan out and actually start to traverse as many of the friend edges going out from there or coming in from there, because that's actually an undirected edge, um, for as many friend edges as you have in your graph. And you actually get returned all the me and your direct friend, or your friend of a friend, or your friend of a friend of a friend, et cetera, et cetera. And then that's bounded in the size of the graph where you have the um, transcribed by friend edges. Uh, you can actually then have um, various uh, flavors of that, uh, in particular, um, bounded transitive closure. So for example, the second one there is actually traverse two to four friend relationships. So what you actually are specifying there is me, friend, star, so you're indicating it's another variable length path. What you're actually saying is at least two friend edges, but at most four friend edges, and bring me back all results that conform to that. And what we also then have actually as a third flavor of uh, this uh, variable length pattern matching uh, paradigm is the notion of actually traversing a union of uh, likes and no's one or more times. So the actual me colon likes pipe character no star essentially means one or more times any combination of likes or no's. So likes, 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 no's, 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 likes will be returned as well as likes, as well as likes, no's, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that's bounded in the size of your graph. And you can obviously combine all these very some uh, bounds uh, together as well. And there's no limit on the number of um, edge labels that you can uh, express a union over. So that's variable length relationship patterns. And as I mentioned, that's actually really, really super useful. Um, it is possible to do that in SQL. Uh, certainly in some variants, you have common table expressions. It's just much more difficult to do that. You can obviously also simulate that with unions, but that starts to also get very cumbersome. So anyway, this is a really good way of actually expressing quite a lot of complexity in quite a um, short space of uh, text. Um, and the next portion is actually the ability to actually return paths, which is something that uh, is not possible currently with SQL, at least to my knowledge. So if you actually look at the returning paths segment and the first uh, query there, match P equals, and then there's some path over there. And by the way, these things needn't just be node edges nodes. You can actually start composing chains for as long as you want. But essentially, match P equals some path, return P will actually return all the paths conforming to that particular pattern. And what you can then actually obviously do after that as well is order it by length and things like that. And actually what P will look like is it will be in order the nodes and edges, nodes and edges returned um, returned in that way. And then we actually also have functions on paths that you can actually um, invoke, say for example, return nodes of P. Uh, and what that will actually do is just return you the nodes that actually formed, uh, formed uh, the part of that path. So 
if pattern matching is the absolute beating heart of cipher something else that follows very much closely after that is the notion of linear composition and that's a sort of notion of top-down flow and query paths and essentially uh, i'll try and take it apart using that example query over there so what we actually have in cipher is the uh, rule that a query needs to end with a return but if you want to actually break up your query by doing set aggregations along the way or if you want to mix reads and writes in your query which is also possible to do with cipher we actually use a keyword or a construct that's very similar to return and that it also projects but it's like an intermediate projection and that's actually uh denoted by this with keyword over here so i'll just walk you through that query over there so what we actually do in line one is we do some sort of match and what the results that match will actually be placed into a binding table that binding table will then be used as an input into the width statement in number two and what width will do as written over there is it will actually pass through the variable me and it will pass through the aggregation of um sorry the count of all of the frames as frame but what that means is in line three what's available to that match is the variable me and also the variable friends but the variable friend won't be available essentially with acts as a gate if you've not actually uh, written uh, a variable in your with statement it is no longer visible after that query so um, in line three we then actually continue uh, matching further on the table of results uh, uh, produced by line one and so in line three we actually take the means that were previously matched they all had to have a label of person and some name which is parameterized and then matching further on and then we finally actually return um, that count that aggregation from line two as friends and now we're also counting up the enemies so um, hopefully that actually gives you a, a notion as to um, what's meant by linear composition so um, the idea is basically each function you can look at each function as a uh, sorry each clause as a function taking in a table and actually transforming it in some way maybe adding more rows or maybe adding more columns and then actually passing it down through to the next clause and uh, with with acting as a horizon what we actually call in cipher the two different query parts so line one would be a query part lines three and four would be another query part and with just basically glues these guys together and that's actually been a very very useful paradigm to have very much borrowed from modern programming languages and we have found that the top down uh, writing and reading order it has actually proven very useful and that's certainly something that our um, customers and developer community very much appreciate being able to do so just a quick so, note so Petra, uh, we have about 10 minutes left right okay i'll i'll hurry up on that yeah i'm about halfway through so um just to give you a quick example of um uh co quite a sort of complex graph of lots of uh, different um events happening and an actual query that you can actually pose in a quite a short number of lines so actually this is initially inspired by the h1n1 crisis back in uh certainly i was working uh, in a data collection in the uk on this back in 2009 so anyway i had absolutely no idea it's going to actually be foreshadowed by current events but uh, anyway it actually just shows the suitability of uh, modeling complex domains using graphs and actually in a few short lines you can actually express quite a complicated query Anyway, there won't be time to actually walk through that, so I'll just move on very quickly. This is actually just showing um, SQL versus Cypher. In particular, I want to actually focus on the fact that the Cypher statement has a uh, transitive closure statement. So actually, it's a variable length part, and it's actually this is just showing again how much longer it takes to actually formulate that in SQL, and obviously the, the time needed to um, absorb and parse it. Right, uh, there's also a little bit about the Neo4j Cypher query engine. This is actually very, uh, very similar to relational uh, database engines. So essentially, there's nothing really uh, spectacularly novel happening here. But essentially, what we have is that a query string comes in, it's passed, extra semantic analysis is performed on the result in um, abstract syntax tree. We you, uh, take the usual um, route of actually uh, uh, finding the cheapest uh, logical plan using some statistics that we uh, maintain in the database coming up with an optimal uh, logical plan and then we transform that into a tree of um, execution uh, physical planning uh, operators and then we execute the query so um, one thing i will say is that uh, because it's a graph obviously we actually did have to add an extra operator to but over and above uh, the usual relational operators and that was in particular to do with expanding outwards from a node 
Right, so just a very quick uh, mention on the Open Cipher project. So this was the um, uh, bit I mentioned earlier on in that we actually found that Cipher was just a very, very useful and a good thing to have. And let's actually spread the uh, spread it across um, as many graph database implementations as possible. So anyway, a few links uh, over here for you to look at afterwards. Um, certainly what, we, what I can say is that the language artifacts, so the provision of grammars, of formal semantics, especially the TCK or technology compatibility kit, certainly did a heck of a lot to actually rocket boost implementation. And actually on the website, you can see the um, full, uh, full list and probably there are many others of open cipher implementers. And that's just showing you actually what uh, one of these tests look like. And we've got well over 2000 of them. So it's actually a really great way of ensuring that your implementation absolutely does comply with um, cipher semantics. So onto a uh, graph query language or GQL. Uh, so essentially, as uh, Vina had mentioned in uh, the introduction, this is actually an ongoing um, effort uh, to actually standardize a new graph query language, property graph query language under the auspices of ISO IEC. And how this actually came about was that a couple of years ago, we had the following situation exemplified by the three M tabs up at the top. We actually had that as more graph database implementations are coming to the fore, we were starting to see lots of different languages starting to arise. And this is not really great for industry, having sort of multiple versions of languages that have great intersection with each other. So it's actually time to take all these languages, all the commonalities, but also all the extra added bits that uh, each one added uh, which made it special and actually rather fuse that into a standard graph query language. And that is how GQL was born. And this actually shows a little bit more about that process. So um, this is the first international uh, standard database languages project since SQL was incepted in 1987. So up, until, up until now, SQL, any new language that's come about or any new paradigm that's come about like XML has always been piggybacked on top of SQL. So this is the first time that a standalone language that sits alongside SQL rather than on top or underneath or next to sort of tucked away to the side of SQL has actually happened. And the vote actually went through successfully on that in uh, 2019. And essentially, this is what I and my colleagues and a lot of other um, industrial partners across uh, all the major vendors have been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, and that's to essentially do the work on the following two. So we actually have that uh, SQL of Caesar language that's ever evolving and graphs have actually become huge everywhere. And probably it's no surprise that SQL itself is also looking to have something called property graph query extensions or PGQ. So this is going to be the next new part of SQL. Uh, it's slated for release in 2022. And what will happen here is that essentially you'll be able to virtualize a graph from an underlying relational database. So essentially you'll be able to map from the tables a virtual graph that you can actually then query using exactly the same querying capabilities that you'll find in GQL, all of which is very, very heavily influenced by Cypher. So those two, the, the pattern matching capabilities, the reading of graphs will be shared by the two languages. And that's where you actually find that the same people are more or less involved in both groups. What GQL will also give you though is loads of other things such as a DML allowing for multiple graphs and actually being able to form views and uh, graph projections and graph scheme and all sorts of other things as well also slated for release in 2022. And we're hoping that actually future versions of uh, GQL will then actually take graphs as a sort of substrate and then just take it much, much further, such as looking at streaming, temple graphs, et cetera. Uh, this is just a very quick picture, just showing this sort of, just a really small snapshot of um, all the various languages and all the various academic efforts as well. that have actually been undertaking, uh, undertaken over the last uh, 30 years or so, that's actually leading into the uh, formation of GQL as well as what each language brought in particular to the picture. And just very quickly, I'll just mention the extensions. So this will be forming part of GQL, the standard, but it will also actually be coming in a, a future version of uh, Cypher as well. So essentially what we actually have here is uh, the notion of uh, repetition of path patterns. So instead of just being able to repeat edge labels, we might actually be able to repeat whole patterns as well. Um, and actually here's an example showing how the, the query actually evaluates. Um, probably those of you who are very familiar with Sparkle, this is analogous to Sparkle 1.1 property paths, but what it actually will also consider are property predicates and node labels as well. And this is just showing again some of the um, various uh, extra um, knobs and twiddles you can actually apply to that. But also things like label expressions, etc. 
uh, one will also be able to configure path matching semantics. So you'll be able to actually express whether or not a path uh, is applied under node homo isomorphism, edge isomorphism, or homomorphism. And there are different uh, reasons to actually allow each of these in different contexts, depending upon the domain. Uh, also, as you'd expect, uh, path pattern output modifiers. Do you want all paths? Do you want all shortest paths? Do you want any shortest paths, etc.? And uh, data types as well. So a lot of, where it's very similar to SQL, we'll be reusing SQL exactly as is, but then also the extra things as well, such as a lot of uh, nested data, and in particular, the graph-related data types. That is nodes, edges, paths, and graphs. Uh, schema as well. So traditionally, Cypher has been a schema-free. This has been a really good thing. But we also do have use cases where the notion of a schema is actually would actually be a good thing, and that's especially more uh, mature domains or domains we actually have data governance or data quality structures. And uh, probably just second last is actually the notion of having uh, the ability to uh, refer to and manage multiple named graphs and to also project graphs, and uh, also to actually allow for um, uh, graph composition, how uh, you can actually undertake uh, combinatorial um, operations across multiple graphs to form, say, a new graph and, and say, maybe project a subgraph out of that graph, et cetera. And this actually would allow you to set up very complex workflows. And um, yeah, that's that will certainly be a very powerful thing. And this is where the compositionality works. So the output of one query can form the input to another query. And that's uh, essentially one of our goals as well. Um, and it's just some uh, key papers that we've been looking at recently. But I've got to say there are many, many, many more, and there's just not enough time to give space to them, unfortunately. But uh, we definitely are standing on the shoulders of giants in this regard. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Petra. Uh, that was an excellent uh, overview of CIFR and extensions and standardization efforts. Uh, we will take the questions at the end, and but for now, we will move on to uh, Professor Ozu. Okay, let me share my screen and hopefully it will work properly this time. You yep. can see it? Yes. Good. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it uh, allowed me to get my thoughts together on this topic. Uh, we've been working on bits and parts of it, and uh, this was an opportunity to put an entire talk together. You will notice that I have uh, far more slides than I can cover in 30 minutes. The idea was to have an internally coherent presentation, uh, but I don't intend to cover all of it. The, the, you can use the slides for uh, later on as background, and I hope uh, you won't mind me skipping through a bunch of slides or going fast on, on some uh, some parts. I. The idea is to give you an overview of how uh, distributed RDF and Sparkle uh, execution, uh, what works have, have been done. So, so um, I should say that all of my work in this area are, uh, is done in uh, jointly with uh, uh, two colleagues, Lei Zhou at Peking, Peng Peng at Hunan, and Lei Chen at Hong Kong uh, USD. And these are either my uh, former students or my academic grand uh, uh, grand uh, grandsons. The my my work with my own students focus on property graphs, mostly the last few years on streaming uh, streaming property graphs. But uh, that's a not, that's a talk for another day. So um, the uh, RDF uh, use cases are quite common. You've probably focused on all of these. And uh, RDF is the, one of the building blocks of knowledge graphs and, and the semantic web. And uh, the um, linked open data uh, the, in the latest count is about 1,200 uh, data sets. And nobody really exactly knows how many triples there are. But the, uh, the, the best guess I, I could find is over 100 billion triples. Uh, my my guess is that that's conservative because Uniprot, on its own, which is the biological uh, uh, knowledge graph, um, in itself or RDF store in itself uh, reports over eighty four billion uh, triples. But but uh, the RDF data sets are growing, and and the growth in this case is fairly fast. 
uh, uh, LOD's growth from about 10 years ago to today has been substantial. And uh, all of these lead to uh, the issues uh, of, of managing this RDF data. Uh, so for people like me who are uh, fundamentally data management researchers, when you give us a data model and a query language, uh, we are on, in our zone. I think this is where, where the data management issues come up. We could look at declarative query processing and the obvious solutions are not efficient. So the database community or data management community typically focuses on, on the efficiency in query, uh, query execution. The initial systems for RDF were single machine or centralized. But uh, with the growth in data set sizes, uh, they, uh, we've, we've gone to distributed solutions, the, what I call scale out, which is on the left, which is really you have a large RDF data set. And to get uh, a better performance, you typically partition this data set over multiple uh, uh, machines and then uh, work, look at executing Sparkle queries in parallel. And on the other hand, the uh, uh, independent data sets have been growing with a lot of RDF data sets and these have their own owners and they have their Sparkle endpoints and that's uh, and they do want to keep and maintain their own data. And for that type of an environment, federated solutions ha have been developed. So uh, that's the setting for um, uh, uh, the, the distributed uh, uh, Sparkle or distributed RDF. Uh, there was a, a the recent EDBT uh, conference in uh, about two weeks ago, uh, Katya Hose gave a very nice um, keynote on knowledge graphs and the way that he is she uh, categorized the systems is is uh, depicted here and uh, and uh, she basically talked about centralized and then client server and so on on to streaming I, I i worked on this a little bit more and i think i have i like a little bit finer granularity so from my perspective there is the centralized and centralized ones can be either more or less relational so take the triple table and and work with that or it could they could be graph based i'm not going to be talking about that or they could be scale out solutions which have a number of different alternatives or they could be federated solutions where you have sparkle endpoints uh, from which uh, uh, you, where you can actually execute uh, uh, Sparkle queries, or some of the uh, endpoints may not be Sparkle endpoints. They can store RDF data, but have no processing capability. And uh, uh, streaming systems have started uh, to appear as well uh, uh, in, in terms of the RDF streaming. So what I'm going to do today is only talk about part of the scale out, uh, the, the query partitioning cloud-based partial evaluation and the federated system, the, uh, the others I will not touch, uh, touch upon. Katya's uh, keynote is uh, going to be put, I think on YouTube, I don't think it is there yet, uh, but if you check EDBT 2021 uh, conference website, you will uh, probably find when that goes online. I would, I would highly recommend uh, watching her uh, watch, watching her presentation. So the outline of, of the slides, not the talk necessarily, is it starts with an RDF introduction, which I won't go through because uh, I, I understand you've covered the basics of RDF. I'm, I have two points there that I want to touch upon uh, that are important for the later discussion. Then I have some uh, uh, overview slides on centralized systems. Again, I won't touch up on those, and then I'll jump into scale out systems. So these are mostly for, for background. The only thing I want to touch upon in RDF in, uh, uh, introduction is the semantics of Sparkle. Um, uh, and I'm only focusing on uh, a, a subset of Sparkle, which is called the BGP, basic graph pattern. Uh, so as, as Sparkle query, as uh, I'm sure you've uh, you, you looked at, consists of these triple patterns. And 
the a collection of these triple a query that consists of only these triple patterns, nothing else, no unions, no optionals, etc., are uh, is called the BGP uh, basic uh, 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 graph pattern uh, uh, sparkle query. So if you really look at those, the the sub sparkle semantics is one of subgraph matching using homomorphism. And the operational semantics, how you can actually think of this is that you go into your uh, uh, triple store, you find the, uh, the, all the triples that, ma that match each of, these, each of these individual triples. So on the right, I, uh, he, this one has five triples, uh, uh, triple patterns. And on the right, I have, uh, I have five lists as, as, as tables. And, 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 and really the, uh, one, the one way to think about sparkle semantics is that you're taking joints. So in the, in the, uh, because the, the, uh, the subjects have the same variables, uh, uh, sorry, this, I wrote this wrong object. This should be subject, subject joints. The, you're doing a subject, subject join, and then you're doing a uh, subject object join and then here you're doing a subject object join as well uh, these all, all should be different so that's that's fundamentally the only thing that you need uh, that is important to keep in mind the other thing about sparkle is the sparkle query shapes because these come uh, quite uh, um, uh, uh, quite a bit in the um, uh, in, in the subsequent discussion these sparkle query shapes uh, play a role uh, most of sparkle queries are of the star shape where you have a single vertex from which these uh, 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 predicate or, or property edges uh, emanate. You can have trees, chains, cycles, and more complex queries, which might typically people when talk about, uh, they talk about these complex queries, they talk about two star queries or three star queries attached to each other, but they don't have to be only stars. They could be anything. So this one is a star, a chain, and a cycle query. Okay, so th this is the only part of Sparkle that is important to, to uh, uh, follow. So now I'm going to just jump into scale out uh, systems. And um, uh, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about graph partitioning. Uh, because the, all of these systems assume that the, the graph is partitioned. And then I'll talk about three uh, different approaches. So the objective of, of partitioning, of course, and this appears in, in uh, relational systems, et cetera, as well, is that you take uh, your data and you somehow partition it, uh, or sharding is, is what it's called. Uh, partitioning in this case is horizontal partitioning. So you take uh, the table and horizontally cut it and put each partition in a different worker. And then the query then executes in parallel on, 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 on this one. And some of the uh, systems that have proposed taking the triple table and simply using hashing, uh, simple hashing on the triple table to get the partition. One of the problems with this is that when you're doing uh, those subject object joins, et cetera, the, you get way too many intermediate results. So your join costs uh, uh, increase. And in particular, when you're doing interpartition joins, these uh, you need to move data around and this becomes uh, complica uh, difficult. So the issue here is the triple table does not uh, capture the relationships between the triples. So people have actually started looking at uh, uh, direct graph partitioning techniques where the data is not simply a table, but it's a gra graph, but you have the same objective where you want to partition it into different, uh, uh, different uh, worker nodes or machines. Two typical uh, ways, um, uh, uh, approaches to this, it, and this is not specific to RDF, this is uh, for property graphs as well, is either edge cut or what we call vertex disjoint or vertex cut or edge, edge, edge dis disjoint. And the objectives in, in the graph partitioning is, is, is in, in any data partitioning is you want to um, uh, keep the partitions to be more or less balanced so that the workload is balanced across the worker nodes. 
um, you want, and, and depending on whether you're doing vertex disjoint or edge disjoint, you want to put uh, one vertex or one edge, each, each vertex or each edge in a different partition. And while you're doing it, you want to minimize the edge and vertex cuts because those are the things that either cause extra communication or state maintenance, as, as I will uh, show you. Most of these techniques, graph partitioning techniques, are what I call workload agnostic. There are some te uh, techniques that, that take the workload into account. What if my workload consisted of this? What can I do with the graph? But the techniques I'm going to talk about are workload agnostic. So um, work, vertex disjoint partitioning puts each vertex in one partition. So this will cause uh, edges to be cut. And, uh, and we want to minimize those because they, 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 each edge cut causes communication across uh, different, uh, uh, different partitions, different worker nodes. The alternatives are, are uh, hashing uh, on the IDs of the vertices, the simple uh, case, which gives you very balanced and it's very fast and, and, and simple, but it causes high, um, uh, 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 high number of, of uh, um, uh, intermediate results and high, high number of, of edge cuts. And the other, the, the gold standard in this, case, in, in this domain is what is called the Metis uh, family of algorithms, which basically uh, goes a, by taking the graph and kind of coarsening the graph. So they, where you're looking at subgraphs that you represent as super vertices, and then you can successively do these until you get to a, a, a graph from, you start from G0, you get to uh, successively um, coarsen graphs to GN, where GN is so small, it doesn't matter the, the, uh, the, the cost of partitioning, you use any partitioning technique to, uh, to partition GN, and then you start uncoarsening, going back and reflecting at, uh, uh, reflecting that partition on the, on the full graph. That's the idea. So um, a very simple case where I took one graph and I used uh, a, a hash function uh, based on, on, on the vert vertex labels, and you get this and all of these dashed lines are, are cuts, and that's actually painful. Uh, this doesn't reflect it well. And uh, the vertex disjoint partitioning performs well for graphs with, uh, where the degrees are low, but uh, on power low graphs, which are very common, they cause many, many edge, edge cuts. And, and you can use METIS, but the METIS has very high uh, computation overhead, and it really doesn't scale to large graphs. Uh, so almost all of the systems that provide that uh, uh, do um, uh, vertex-based partitioning, they provide hashing as part of their toolbox to, to go. And the, the important issue here is that we, in, in this case, as I'll talk uh, a little bit uh, later, in RDF case, what becomes more important for minimizing interpartition joins is not uh, to minimize the edge cuts, but really to in minimize the predicate cuts. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that a little, uh, a little later on. So um, I'll skip this because I haven't gone over the uh, uh, example, but the example is in the earlier point. In the edge disjoint partitioning case, we put each edge at a different partition. And what this causes is that the vertices are replicated. In other words, if, if the, if uh, the two edges that are placed on different partitions share a vertex, that vertex has to be repeated in both places. And that, act, that means that you, if, if the, the, uh, the, the state of those vertices need to be maintained in both, pl uh, in both places. So if there are, uh, uh, that, that becomes an issue. In RDF, this is less of an issue, simply because the uh, RDF is a simple uh, graph model where, where the vertices only have labels. So there isn't much issue of updating on, on, the, um, on, on, the, on those edges. And uh, edge disjoint partitioning is used a lot in cloud-based systems. Uh, I'll talk about later on, because in cloud-based systems, what they, what they do is they look at the, each edge with the particular predicate and each, uh, all the edges with the same predicate go into one file that goes on HDFS. 
And the, the objective in cloud-based systems is to minimize the scans. So, so the, the, uh, this allows you to, to focus the scans on a particular file, uh, depending on what the, what the Sparkle query, uh, query is asking. So that's important. And again, if I take this and do it there, uh, do the edge of this joint partitioning, I get what is on the right. And these dashed vertices are replicated vertices between uh, different uh, 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 partitions. They, so number two, the home partition is P2, but I replicate it in P3 as well. Okay. And these perform well on power low graphs and they are high, fast and highly serializable. But the star queries are problematic because in star queries, what you want is you want the vertex and all of the edges coming, all of the neighboring vertices to be in one partition and edges will, will break those up. Um, and, and, and we might get high vertex replication. So again, the example there is one. So let me jump into the three types of scale out systems I'm going to talk about. Um, the first one is query partitioning systems. So the, this, these start with a partition data set. So D1 uh, to D6 uh, are, are the partitions. We've already partitioned the RDF graph. Now we partition uh, the, the qu uh, Sparkle query. So we get subqueries. And the idea is that we wanted to partition uh, the uh, Sparkle query in such a manner that I can execute as many of them, I, I, I can execute each of these as independently as I can on one, at, at one, on one of the, at the, the worker nodes. So I, don't, I try to avoid the joins that, uh, of, of the partial results that, uh, uh, that are created uh, by, by these subqueries. So the, the problem is really distributed execution of these queries over the, uh, the partition data. And this is really very, very analogous to distributed query processing and optimization in relational systems. And there are a number of uh, uh, systems of this type. The main idea of these systems that you need to keep in mind is the, the how do I partition the data and the query in such a way that uh, the interpartition joins are, are minimized. And all of the techniques that, uh, they, they, that have been proposed, uh, the, there's a high degree of coupling between query decomposition and the partitioning that they use. So they either say, this is the partitioning that we, uh, we do on the data, and here's how you can partition the query based on that partitioning, or they, they say, this is how I want to partition the query, this is the characteristics that I want, and to meet those characteristics, this is how I partition the, uh, partition the data. Uh, so two example systems that I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, again, this is a um, partition graph uh, where the uh, into two partitions. Uh, the uh, amber ones are one partition, blue ones are the other, and these green uh, dashed edges are your edge cuts. That's basically where communication between partitions goes. Uh, one system with, uh, with base says, let's first do a partitioning using METIS, but they admit that they can actually use something else that doesn't matter. This is the base partitioning that gives you a nice one. And then I'm going to uh, replicate vertices using n hop. So if I'm using one hop, then for the, on the, in the amber one, I'm going to, to reach out into the blue and pick the, the one hop reachable vertices and replicate them in, in the amber one. Similarly for the, the, blue, uh, the blue one, I'll reach out and replicate uh, the other ones. But it, it could be n hop, and of course, as n gets higher, your replication cost increases. Uh, but you can you can evaluate more queries uh, uh, um, uh, in in that uh, independently in that case. But in the extreme, of course, it's you don't partition it, but that's not uh, what you want, of course. So when you get a, a query Q, what you look is the the radius, which is really what is the distance from the, uh, uh, the query at the center that matches the center of this graph to the edge. And if that, if the radius of the query is, uh, is larger than n, then I have to partition it into several subqueries such that 
the, uh, the, the radius of each subquery is, is less than uh, or equal to n. And then I execute each of those subqueries on, on, those, uh, on, on a partition. The second uh, alternative is very similar, uh, which is vertex uh, block uh, um, proposal. And they were proposed two years apart, interestingly. They also talk about uh, uh, partitioning the, uh, the, the triples across uh, uh, ver vertices, but they use what they call semantic hashing. So what they do is they first form triple groups. They say a triple, a gr uh, they group the triples based on whether they have the same subject or whether they have the same object or whether they have the same predicate. So they can have S triple groups, O triple groups or P triple groups. And then they, they, they use a hashing function to allocate each of these triple groups into machines. And then they basically do uh, allow re uh, uh, replication. Uh, the idea of replication is this. So if this is your baseline partitioning and you have this query which reaches there, this query is not independently executable, of course, because you need to, uh, you need to take the join of the partial results over these three partitions. But the idea they have is that if I extend P1 by uh, a little bit over, then I can handle P1 on its own. And similarly, I can extend P5 a bit and I can handle P5 uh, on its own. Uh, the, the proposal is not very, very different than uh, the other one. It, it's just how they partition the query and how they partition the, uh, the, the graph uh, uh, slightly uh, changed, but the main idea is the same. Uh, we've been working on this and this uh, is a, a little bit different. This is not published yet. Uh, uh, it's under submission. The main point of our work was the recognition that all of the previous work try to uh, minimize the edge cuts, but the edge cuts are not what really causes the interpartition joins. Uh, if you you can increase your edge cuts, but if all of the edges that you cut involve a single predicate, they are all uh, born uh, born on, or they are all resident or something then really the, the class of queries that you can execute independently increases quite, quite a bit. So uh, the idea here then is that you, we want to, to, instead of minimizing edge cuts, we want to minimize the predicate cuts in, at, uh, even at the cost of increasing uh, edge, edge cuts. So the next couple of slides, uh, uh, um, introduce how we do it. I'm not going to go through. It's the similar idea to, to METIS, which is that we coarsen and, and then we partition. But, but coarsening, the really important case is being able to choose the internal predicate. So how do I form the, uh, the uh, super vertices uh, uh, that as, I, as I coarsen? And that we use a greedy algorithm that's based on weakly connected components. And, and we, we choose those uh, uh, the predicates, and then we we partition the uh, the coarse graph on the right, and then we go back and uncoarsen the uh, uh, the the original graph. And we have a formula for uh, we have a me uh, methodology for uh, processing queries on it, and uh, and it uh, gives us fairly good performance. I don't have time to go through it. So the query partitioning approaches are, are really um, uh, very uh, quite high performance, great for parallelizing centralized RDF data, but the query decomposition is not easy. And query decomposition is difficult, even in relational cases, but then they're uh, uh, difficult here as well. And, uh, and, and as I said at the beginning, the query deco decomposition and data decomposition are very tightly integrated. It will be interesting to use a adapt a relational distributed query processing methodology here. Um, what, by that I mean that what we do in the relational case is that we do query decomposition, we do data lo localization. Uh, the, the query decomposition gives us an algebraic query. We look at how the data is allocated, uh, and then we take this um, uh, algebraic query query uh, tree 
and partition it so that uh, the, uh, the the joins are minimized. And then we have, we create a distributed uh, query plan and optimize it, figure out how to do the, uh, 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 how to put together the, the results. And when we execute the query on these local sites, then we execute the distributed execution plan. This is not, this is really not done in the case of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the um, query partitioning uh, based uh, graph, uh, graph processing, unfortunately, because they, there isn't much work in, 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 in this domain. Fundamentally, as I'll mention later on, there isn't a uh, well-developed algebra for, for, for Sparkle. One uh, alternative is partial query evaluation. We did this uh, a, a little bit. So um, again, the RDF data is partitioned. Uh, we don't care if it's partitioned, but we don't partition the query. What we use is the partial query evaluation uh, technique that uh, programming language people have, uh, have, uh, have uh, invented. So what that is, is that when you have a function on X, we, we rewrite the, the function as two uh, with with two arguments, one is s, which is the, the, some of the arguments that you know, the inputs that you know, and the other one is the unknown inputs. And then we basically uh, execute the 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 f f prime on s on just s to get the the, uh, the what is known, and we leave the d as the unknown, and we we execute another function on it to get the final answer. So in our context. What are the known uh, what, uh, known uh, inputs? As it is basically the uh, the, the query itself, and uh, what we also know is all of these partitions plus the the, the what we call the extended edges, which are really uh, extended vertices, which are really vertices on the other partition that are at the end of crossing crossing edges, and then from here. We base the idea is that we send the query to each partition. Each partition com computes partial results, but these are not final results because what we have are we are missing these crossing matches, and then we assemble it uh, the uh, final result from uh, these partial results by a join operator. And the setup is is what you would expect. Uh, a bunch of machines over which data is 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 uh, distributed. We do local evaluation on these machines, and then we do an assembly phase, which can be either centralized. We send the results back to where the query originated from, and assemble there, or we do distributed joint processing. So, Tamar, we've got about five minutes left. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll finish. So this is uh, uh, this has high performance due to parallelization. It doesn't have the, the, the problem to deal with the query decomposition, but uh, you need to modify the RDF systems at each site to be able to deal with this partial query evaluation te uh, technique. I'm uh, the final category here is cloud-based solutions. So again, the data is RDF data is partitioned. And the Sparkle query is run as map reduced shops. This is really your typical data parallel execution. And the main idea here is that query operations are map reduced jobs. And so you need to have a map reduced systems that implements all of the uh, relational operators that you might be using in, 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 in this processing. And as I said, the, you do typically do edge based uh, uh, partitioning here to, to get across. An example is hard, uh, our Hadoop RDF, where uh, the, the, they split the predicates and then they basically split each predicate. So each of these is a file. So all the, all the, the triples, which has the has name predicate are in one file and so on. And then they do far, further dividing based on, on the object part of, of, the, uh, of the graph. And then when they get a, a, a query, they, they first choose a particular uh, file and for each triple pattern, and they execute that triple pattern on those files as map reduced jobs, and then they they do a map reduced join at the very end. So I'm, I'm going very short here because there's a very nice book uh, that you should, uh, you can uh, probably, Stanford has a subscription to this, 
so you can download and, and read it. Uh, it, it. These are highly scalable systems. Again, they're inherently fault tolerant because of MapReduce, but the performance is bounded by what MapReduce can do. All those intermediate relations are go, uh, uh, that you generate is going to be causing a lot. And you have to write the results of those to HDFS and then run the uh, join job as a uh, join as a separate uh, uh, map reduce job, which which means you have to read from HDFS again, and uh, and and whatever optimizations you do, you have to do it outside of the map reduce platform. Let me talk about federated systems. These are uh, different. As I said, you have these RDF sources. So what you really it, it, when in the uh, scale out systems we took a D and we partitioned it into a set. Here we're going the other way. We have a set of D, D, uh, D sub i's and we're putting them together to get a D. And each of these D sub i's are a Sparkle endpoint, meaning that if you give them a Sparkle query, they can execute it. And you get the Sparkle query, you decompose it, you run it in each of these Sparkle endpoints, and then you, 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 comp uh, you, you compose them. And typically you have this RDF resources and the idea, main idea is one of data integration. You're starting from bottom, and uh, the which are the sources, and you're going you're going up, and you always have a control site which maintains a bunch of metadata that uh, is about access patterns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And typically, what you do is you do the query site. The control site takes the query, does a query decomposition, and selects which parts of the query or which QI goes. Uh, should be executed on which of the sources. You do a local evaluation on the sources. Yeah, you get the results back and then you, you, you join the partial results at the other end. The typical way that you can do query uh, decomposition, I'll demonstrate by a, uh, a, a, an example here. You have uh, this query. We basically uh, determine uh, this can actually, you can tell from here as well, the, the prefix is G. These two triple patterns can be executed on geonames. Uh, this, uh, the third triple pattern can be executed on any one of these, on any one of these, so we'll have to choose. And the third, uh, the last one can be executed at New York Times. So uh, you divide these into three queries, Q, uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, you uh, and you execute them at those sites and then combine the results. And, uh, uh, and then you do some data localization there, as I talked about. And therefore you, but what you basically happens is exactly what, uh, what I described. You take this, you determine the sites uh, where you're going to execute it, you execute them and you compose them. That's the federated. The question is, what if you have some which are not Sparkle endpoints, in which case you use the mediators and you build mediators that pretend uh, that have wrappers that pretend that these uh, sources can execute uh, 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 Sparkle uh, uh, Sparkle queries. So they 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 act as if they uh, there are Sparkle endpoints there. Um, uh, uh, and there are exa uh, examples of federation. Uniprot is one. This is an example that actually goes to multiple Uniprot da uh, data stores uh, and and and. Picks, uh, get, uh, gets the results. It's a service-oriented uh, uh, federated exec, uh, query execution. And, and the, this is the advantage is that this is data integration approach. So you don't, you take the data, uh, the, the data sets as they're given. You're not trying to do anything with them and, and, and you go from there. But the Sparkle endpoints are notoriously unreliable. There are studies that show that at any one given time, up to 64% of these Sparkle endpoints uh, are, are, uh, are offline. So if you pose a query, uh, they may be offline. So basically what you need to do is this kind of fault tolerant or uh, um, uh, query processing techniques that, uh, that can withstand uh, uh, those uh, uh, the offline ones. And not all RDFs, um, uh, the, when you do have to do mediators, that's heavy duty. So the conclusion is that there are there is a there's a lot of work. I listed the systems at the beginning, but uh, I cannot say that the the technology is as mature as as distributed 
relational data management. They are not. Part of the reason is that there are multiple communities that work with RDF. Semantic web community really focuses on functionality, much less on, on performance. Uh, so if they can execute queries, uh, generally they're, uh, they're satisfied. And we worry about performance, but uh, the data management community has focused more on property graphs than on RDF graphs. And, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's an issue. And uh, most work considers only BGP. Uh, but uh, full sparkle 1.1 has these optionals and unions and aggregation and so on those are really not well handled yet we we have some work in, uh, that that's ongoing uh, algebra definitions are starting there is a recent paper that's defining an algebra for sparkle that um, I'm not sure how I how how I feel about it yet because I I'm in the middle of studying it. But uh, there is there is a prospect that if those algebras uh, um, uh, are are successful, we could get somewhere. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities for using views uh, and view based optimization, multi query optimization, cost based optimization. These are open problems that we haven't done and. The work so far only considers static RDF graphs, and uh, as, as they evolve over time, how do the uh, how do you do incremental query processing to cope with this is uh, is not known. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Very good. Took a few more time uh, minutes, but uh, I apologize. Yeah, so we still have like nine minutes left okay. for uh, any questions. So there is two questions in the there yeah, are two there. questions that people have answered. Mm -hmm. One is for uh, Tamer and one is for Petra. Okay, go ahead. So why don't we start with um, the one for Tamer? Uh, can you explain? This is about your parallelization slide. Can you explain why or when parallelization is necessary? Thanks. Okay, so typically you do parallelization, and and it comes in two places. In one of two cases, one is as I uh, mentioned in the federated case, um, there, there are data sets with owners and these owners do not want, uh, uh, do want to maintain ownership of their data. So they're willing to run your queries on their data and they are willing to be part of a federation, but they're not willing to let go of their data. So that's when you do the one type. The parallelization for scale out is when the data set size becomes uh, so high uh, that that uh, running uh, Sparkle queries or any query on a single site becomes a performance bottleneck. Um, either the data set size is too big and you cannot fit in a, on a single machine, or the computation becomes so heavy with especially with concurrently uh, concurrent queries running that you want to you want to be, get intra query parallelism and and inter query parallelism and that's when you when you do choose the scale out route thank you and in general um, commodity hardware is much cheaper than vertically scaling systems thanks that's, for that that's that's true that's true the next question is for petra um, about in general question answering systems, how can you design, how can you write cipher to query a knowledge graph to build question answering systems? The resource map that talk about context around that is the knowledge yeah, graph. Yeah, so I, I think by, by question answering system, they might be meaning when the query is posed in English. So I mean, oh, like how, do you go from, how do you go from English into cipher? So I think you would actually need to employ a, um, natural language processing uh, library to actually transform written English or spoken English and actually pull out uh, verbs and nouns from there and map them basically to, to a pattern essentially. So if you say, um, find me all people who have eaten at a restaurant in San Francisco, you can start to actually formulate basic patterns around that. However, that's not something I think that's actually been explored a lot. So I'd guess any efforts in that area is at a very early stage. I do know of some uh, groups that actually are working on such a thing, but in terms of actually using Cypher now without such a layer, 
is, uh, to my knowledge, not possible. So I actually have a question. Um, what one is, you know, how do we like if we have in, in RDF, if there is the same triple which resides in two different sources, how do we refer to it? If the same triple, if, oh, there, there is the, uh, I didn't uh, show in the pre, uh, preliminary stuff, the each source has, has a particular um, uh, um, uh, identifier and that becomes a prefix. So in the examples that I showed, there was a G, there was a Y, so G was the short, was the prefix. It's almost like XML namespaces that you can okay. use. G refers to geo, uh, uh, and why refer to New York Times, but these are usually long, long URIs that that, that you use. So uh, in our early lectures, we use the example of a uh, of a query such as on a map, show me all the people who um, who were born in winter tour who also died there, right? So let's say you have a question like this. To answer that question, you are not going to find data in one location. So is there a system out, distributed Sparkle execution system out there which could answer this? I mean, all this magic that you were describing in this distributed, uh, in the federated queries, like is there a real federated query Sparkle uh, system out there? What do you mean real? I mean, that, that actually, to which I could go and post queries, distributed queries like that. You mentioned Uniprot, right? That's just right. one, exa right. one well, example. I mean, uni, uni, um, it, it, it depends on, on I, under, I think if I understand your query, one is uh, the one question is how do I know which sources I need to go to, mm -hmm. right? That is not that is not as that's not a solved problem, and that for the data data management community, that's the problem outside of us. In other words, you it's just like SQL. You need to know the schema to formulate a proper SQL query before we can actually worry about how how we execute it. It is the same same issue here. Um, one of the problems, and that's actually, that's, that's an active and important research, uh, research domain on its own in the, in the following sense. Even when you know sources writing Sparkle queries be, beyond uh, simple ones is not an easy task. So people have been working on natural language interfaces to Sparkle. And and those might uh, might be might come to the, to the rescue, but you need to know you need to know where the data is. Uniprod allows you to do it. it it's a federate Unipro, Uniprod knowledge graph it com, uh, combines 150 RDF data sets and allows you to write um, at their website even a particular Sparkle query that uh, goes and uh, gets it from 150, but you still have to know something about what each source of offers. Does it go to those sources in real time or have they integrated the data in one place? No, no, it, it, it goes in real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, I, you might, you can actually f f uh, play around if you want to see how this works within the Uniprod context. If you go to Uniprod website, then uh, there are example queries that you can you can ask them to run, and it will run it in real time and get you results. Or you can try to formulate your own query. I've never tried to formulate my own query because I don't know enough biology to be able to formulate a reasonable query. But I've 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 played around with the sample queries that they've uh, that they've posed to see what they do and how they work. Okay. And just one more question came in. Uh, again to uh, Petra, does Neo4j use any partitioning parallel techniques? Is there a distributed version available, et cetera? It's actually the version uh, in our enterprise version uh, called Fabric, which actually, uh, if you maybe I can provide the link to that, that actually partitions your graph uh, using um, edge disjoint partitioning. I believe it's a variant on that, but I actually haven't worked on that myself, so I can't tell you much more than that. But um, essentially, that is a way of actually spreading out your graph across multiple um, databases. And that's called Fabric. I'll just send the link to that. Uh, in terms of parallel processing, that actually is something that we are undertaking and investigating within our engineering department. Thanks. 
Any other questions? Mike, you have any questions? No. Nope. Okay. Well, we are pretty much at the end of our class time, which is uh, 9.50. Um, so with that, I'd like to really thank our uh, invited guests for giving us a um, fairly detailed and thorough deep dive into both uh, Cipher query processing as well as uh, Sparkle query processing. And I was definitely very struck by the scalability concerns which are being addressed in this uh, distributed and parallel query processing. And that's something that you know is going to be very important as these data sets are getting bigger, we are going to need these uh, techniques for scalable query evaluation. So thank you all uh, for coming and thank you both for um, your illuminating presentations. With that, we conclude. And as far as our class is concerned, we'll continue uh, next Tuesday. And our topic for next Tuesday is going to be how to uh, design the schema of a knowledge graph. Thank you all. Thank you, folks. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.